Okay. Hi everyone. Welcome to day six of our, oh gosh, I just forgot what it's called. Memoir, the memoir challenge. Sorry guys, I was up late last night doing a lot of things on the computer to fix the Star Wars problem that I know all of you experienced. Should be good now for Monday, but believe me, if I had a team of techies, I would have called them in for that. It was, it was quite a night. I'm very, 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 very sorry. We really did everything we could. Um, anyway, moving forward, let's move on to things that I, the things within our realm of control, right? So today the challenge was a crime story. And I didn't get a lot of submissions, but I got a couple. And I also got a love story that I wasn't able to read yesterday. So I'm gonna read that as well at the end to kind of cheer us all up a bit after we hear about some crime. So I had intended on writing down my crime story, but um, as I said, I was a little busy last night, so I, I didn't get a chance to. So I'm just gonna tell you about it. Um, okay, so. When I was about 15, 14, 15, 16, I met a girl named Katie. And Katie was my age. Um, she went to the same homeschool co-op I went to. She was very pretty, very thin, had beautiful red hair. Um, Katie had a brother named Dallin and they lived not too far from us. Uh, sorry, that's my cat. Um, so Katie and I became, we were, we were frenemies. I guess you would say. Like we would have a really good time together, but then she'd make really snide comments about uh, my body and my parents' house and things like that. She was just that kind of person, just kind of putting people down all the time. So she wasn't like my best friend, but I knew her and I cared about her. So when we were about, um, when we were 16, we went to this thing called a winter ball. It was a big dance um, in, Utah and it was in this big beautiful barn and it was open to a bunch of youth dance teams which we were part of. So we went to this winter ball and there happened to be some young adults there as well. So you know it was just a bunch of it, people in the dance community coming to do barn dancing together etc. So we went to that. Katie's mom went, oh, so sorry, that's, um, everybody say hi to Lady Mary. Um, so Katie's mom was at the dance too. And there was this 28 year old guy there who would not leave Katie alone all night long. Like he was obsessed with her. And at the end of the night, we saw him in the corner talking to Katie's mom. And we're like, that's a little strange. But anyway, in our big group of girls, we all just drove home and had a sleepover and kind of didn't worry about it. Um, a couple days later though, Katie Root told us that her mother had decided that this 28 year old, year old man who was obsessed with Katie, that, that she, has, she decided that that was the man she was gonna marry, that Katie was gonna marry. And Katie, again, was 16 years old at the time. Um, this guy was not, he, he wasn't particularly good looking. He wasn't, didn't have anything going for him. He hadn't been to college, but Katie's mom was convinced that she had received a vision from God that told her that this was to be Katie's husband and Katie was to be married within the year. So that happened. Obviously, Katie was very upset about this. She was not interested in marrying this guy. She didn't know anything about. Um, and, and also the fact that her mom was saying that she had had all these visions about it added the pressure and kind of added her not wanting to be in this relationship. So, um, it got to the point where Katie's mom stopped letting her hang out with us. Um, she pretty much cut off all contact for Katie for the outside world. She has sent, she literally, um, locked her in her room locked her in her room. Um, my friend Cosette, who I mentioned in a previous story about road trips, she went, she stopped by to drop off something that Katie had left at her house and um, 
she described to me this like that when she went to Katie's house, Katie tried to run out of the door and her brother manhandled her and dragged her back in and locked her, locked her behind closed doors. Now, we did call the police. We called the police. We called family services. We called the neighbor. We called everybody we could. Um, but because of the way Katie's mom was, because of the way she spoke, because of the way Katie was intimidated and scared to say anything against her in front of her, um, we really got nowhere with anything legally. Um, so we were just worried. We were really worried about our friend. Um, it just seemed like a really strange and shady situation and it transitioned so quickly. Like it went from us having sleepovers at her house and her mom making us like crazy amounts of brownies and like paying for us to rent videos and things like that to all of the sudden we were not allowed near her and she was not allowed any contact. So so we were, we were pretty scared. Um, there was one night and we lived in Utah at the time and Utah gets obviously very cold in the winter. So we were, we were cold. We were, <laughs> uh, sorry, I saw a text message and I got distracted for a second. Anyway, so it was cold in the winter. Katie walked five miles from her house to our house um, in her pajamas to try to escape from her mother. And her mother came back to pick her up. Um, and my mother, I've described her in a couple of videos. She was very non-confrontational. She was very sweet and very kind. And, um, and she was no match for Katie's mom, who was just a freaking temptress. Like she was just, I mean, she's probably like the most evil person I've ever met. So this goes on. After that incident where she, Katie walked five miles to my house in the middle of winter in her pajamas, to try to find somewhere to escape to, I decided that Katie needed some kind of contact. She, her phone was taken away, her instant messenger at the time, which was the way we mostly communicated, her mom would get on her instant message, instant messenger and text us all the time. And so there would be nights like before this where we would be texting or typing stuff to Katie and thinking we were talking to her and it was her mom. And we're like, this doesn't sound like something Katie would say because it was her mom. Her mom was trying to live through her. It was very bizarre. So anyway, so I, I thought Katie needed contact. So I bought her one of those Go phones. It's like a cell phone that you buy at a gas station. It's like 20 bucks and it has minutes on it and you program it. So I bought her a phone. I programmed it with my phone number and that's it. And then I programmed that her number into my phone as Katie. Um, and my friends and I went to her house at night in the middle of the night we, I don't know why we did this part. I don't know why we thought this was the right way to message her. Maybe we had spoken about it at some point, but we drew a dot of lipstick in the very corner of her window to signal her that we had left her something under the windowsill. Um, uh, we thought we were cool. I don't know, but <laughs> so anyway, so we left, we got the phone. At the time I was in school, I was in, it was, I was in my CNA classes at the college and um, in the middle of class, I get a call on my phone and it says Katie. And so I rush out of class, I make an excuse. I go, I pick up the phone and I'm like, hello, Katie, Katie, are you okay? And it's Katie's mom on the other end. And she said, we need to talk. So my heart plummets, I just feel, awful. I know that Katie is now in way more trouble than she was before because she's been, she, her friends have been trying to communicate with her and everything. And she hasn't been like pushing them away. And she essentially came to my parents' house and gave this big speech about her rights as a parent and that, um, I have no right to be that Katie's seven, she was, this, this went on for a long time. This was about a year later at this point. She still hadn't gotten married, obviously, because they couldn't get her to marry this guy without literally like her kicking and screaming down the aisle. Um, but that's, yeah. So, so it was a long time of this, like worrying about Katie and her being locked in her bedroom and 
no one caring and no one listening. And it was a very frustrating time. So anyway, Katie's mom just went off and she yelled at my mom and she yelled at us and she slammed the door and left. And it was very, um, it was a very frustrating day. So after that, we kind of, you know, pulled back a little bit. There's really, you can't save people who don't want to be saved. And at that point, Katie wasn't ready. So there was nothing we could do. So a few years later, down the line, um, my friend Cosette gets married. And we had all been such a tight group of friends back in the day that we, we made this like vow and we took pictures and we signed a thing that we would all go to each other's wedding. So it was very important. So my sister and I head out for Seti's wedding and we decide to check on Katie. And at this point, Katie's mom had moved her to Idaho. Um, no, sorry. First they moved to South Dakota. She moved to South Dakota to start a cult. She started her cult slash compound, started a compound of communal living and was voted out. She was voted off the island of the cultists because she was too crazy. Like, so this is the kind of woman we're dealing with. She starts a cult and then she gets kicked out of it because she's so crazy. So they're in Idaho. She's starting a new compound. This guy, this 28 year old guy who initially her mother had this vision about Katie marrying was living with them because she's like, you're going to marry him. If it kills you, this is what's going to happen. And until then he's going to be right here waiting. So we, found her house. We found her driveway. She lived in the middle of nowhere. My sister and I were, I mean, like 19 and 20 at this point. And we pull up in the car and there's Katie's mom waiting for us. And out of the truck comes this guy who's Katie's betrothed. And he has a massive gun. And Katie's mom says, this is my property and you are not allowed on it. And if you step foot on this property, um, this guy's going to shoot you and there's nothing your families can do about it. And at that point he pulled out his gun and he like, you know, shot some bullets to show he was serious. And I was just freaking stubborn. I was like, shut up. You're not going to shoot us. <laughs> sister was crying and I was like you're a liar this is not your property this is a public road you can't shoot me good luck like I will sue you myself like I was just I was just I just had it just had it because from time to time over the years Kate would reach out to me and just kind of update me on her situation and it was just brutal it's like this stuff it was a lifetime movie event was Katie's life from the age of 16 to what 20 I don't think she got out until she was 24 but at this point we were like well hey we're just here to pick her up for Cosette's wedding we'll be back in a day Katie's an adult now we want to talk to her it's not a big deal and we could see the house in the back you know we could see the house um, the windows were all shuttered and I knew Katie was in that house I knew she was and I was just so angry that this woman would do this would do this to her own daughter you know and so anyway it ended up not leading to anything um but I I definitely tried my hardest to get her charged with kidnapping and holding somebody against their will and um I don't know, being a threatening presence in general. I don't even know. I remember just venting to the officers in this small town in Idaho about this crazy woman in the hills. And they kind of, pretty much what they told me was, well, this is the middle of Idaho. This, these are the kind of people that live here. There's really not much we can do. If we said that every crazy person with a gun who shot, you know, in the air to threaten somebody was going to be under arrest. We'd have to arrest the whole town. So there was nothing they could do. But um, my sister was sure we were going to get murdered that day. I was not. I was like, they're, they're going down first. I'll take them with me. 
Um, but yeah, that's my story about Katie. Uh, it's, I, I, know, I know it's not too criminal, but it felt criminal at the time. And still looking back, it seems very, it's just a very odd story. It's an odd situation. I do feel like if Kate had been in a place where she wanted to escape, it would have become more of a, there would have been more we could do as far as charges pressed, but um, essentially it was just a really abusive mother and her daughter who didn't know how to get out of it. So that's my story about crime and my one of my encounters with a man with a gun. So anyway, <laughs> our next submission, I'm sorry if that rambled a bit. Um, like I said, I, I didn't have time to write it down. Okay, our next submission is from Pat Yearling. Pat, I love your writing so much. I feel like we should just have a segment every day of Pat storytelling because you are such an incredible writer. So thank you so much for submitting this. I was really excited when I saw your name pop up in my inbox this morning. I was like, yes, Pat sent me one. Okay. This is called A Safe Dwelling. She has titles on hers. It was a surprise to hear the phone ring midday. My husband, Carl, was on the other end. Pat, sit down first. Why, what's the matter? I questioned, pulling up a chair. I've accepted an assignment in Warren, Michigan for approximately a year. I'm to leave this Saturday. This was a Wednesday. You'll have to close the apartment, sell the car, pack a few things we'll need for the time we're there and come over later. In 1966, Detroit was very restless with rioting of the African-American population. I didn't want to be caught in the conflict and was concerned where we could live. Carl stayed in a hotel until I came, leaving it up to me to search for a residence wherever I felt safe. Once I got in the car and drove around the area to get an idea of the housing situation, I was alerted to an apartment complex about three miles from the tech center where Carl worked because it looked upscale and clean. I went to the management office and inquired if there were any apartments available. I explained that we had just arrived from Germany and we were not certain how long we would, st we would stay. I asked if they even had furnished apartment, had a firm, furnished apartment to rent. To my surprise, their reply was yes. They didn't rent out the model apartment to just anyway, to just anyone, but instantly saw that we would qualify. The complex was constructed so that there were four apartments with two entranceways on opposite sides of the building, with two apartments downstairs and two upstairs. The apartment I was shown was on the ground floor. It was the perfect place for us. On a Tuesday morning, a week after we'd moved in, I pulled back the drapes in the bedroom to find a parking lot full of people, a van from the local TV station, and even police officers with their squad cars. Reporters caught me standing there staring out and started motioning me for, for me to come inside. What on earth was going on? Then I saw the manager walking around the parking lot with another gentleman and they entered our building. I realized the sounds I'd been hearing about us had something to do with the commotion. It was verified when I heard the men go up the stairs and enter that apartment. Sounds of feet shuffling continued. I steered clear of the window to avoid eye contact with any, anyone. It's a good thing I didn't have to get out that day. Around noon, a hearse maneuvered before the door and a gray sack was transported into the vehicle. Now I was certain something had happened upstairs. That's when my doorbell rang. An apologetic police officer stood before me and blurted out, Madam, I'm sorry to disturb you, but could you please give me a glass of water? I have stomach problems and need to take a pill. Sure, no problem, I said, and, and went to fetch the liquid. When I came back, I inquired, Why did you ask me for water? Couldn't you get it upstairs? I'm sorry to have bothered you, but we aren't permitted to touch anything. Could you tell me what happened? I'm not permitted to say anything. It'll be on the radio, the TV, and in the newspaper soon. Then you will know. Thanks for the water. I need to get back to my work. Foot movements continued upstairs all afternoon, and by 3.30 p.m., I couldn't stand it any longer. I called Carl at his office and told him of the day's activities. I was quite to the point. I think the man upstairs has been murdered. You need to get me a newspaper on the way home. No one will tell me anything. He laughed and thought I was being paranoid. <laughs> until he came home that evening and was hounded outside by the paparazzi. Two men hooked arms on either side of him and said, come with us. 
Once inside the apartment with Carl, they asked to see his German passport. He was questioned extensively. What had we been doing over the weekend? Why were we in the United States? And if he had any knowledge about military installations or tank assembly. After the detectives were convinced a foreigner was not in any way involved with the crime they were investigating, they told us the man in the apartment above had been murdered. They were concerned that he, because he worked at a nearby tank assembly plant and was responsible for the design of secret military inst installation in the vehicles. When our neighbor hadn't shown up for work the second day in a row, his superiors became suspicious. He was known to take blueprints and work on them at home. We were told that a criminal often returns to the crime scene and they were concerned for the safety of the people living in the building. There would be a 24 hour police guard in the hallway and a cruiser would be by frequently. After the man left, I called my parents to tell them to watch the news. I was, I was worried if they saw it on TV, they'd be upset when they heard the address, the address. They were upset anyway. Mom demanded we move out immediately and search for another place to live. Carl was able to calm her down, persuading her with the argument we couldn't have it any better with all, with all the security. The police officer sat by the door for a day, which stretched into months. Greetings would be exchanged as we went in and out. It felt quite natural to have them there. Then came the day, many months later, they caught the burglar slash murderer and the mystery was solved. Our neighbor had been to a veterans meeting in Detroit on that particular Saturday night and met up with some of his wartime buddies. Apparently he had been boasting as drinking men do about a sum of money he kept at home. A Hispanic friend said he didn't have a place to stay that evening and our neighbor invited him to sleep at his place. They came home very late that night in a taxi and which eventually helped the detectives put the crime together. It was likely the man demanded money from his friend, and when he refused, the man was tied up, thrown on the bed, and duct tape placed over his mouth. The visitor searched the apartment until he found the cash in an envelope. Then he called a taxi. We were gone for the weekend and did not return till Sunday morning. By that time, there was nothing to be heard from the bedroom above. It is not known how long he struggled, but our neighbor did die in his attempt to free himself. The night of the attack, the criminal boarded a freighter ship out of Detroit Harbor and that same night sailed to South America. He was found and extradited back to the States for trial. The crime was classified manslaughter and burglary. We stayed there for the duration of Carl's work assignment. We were safe. Thank you, Pat. I, well, at least, I mean, there's, there's no such thing as a happy ending with stories like this, but that's good that they found him and they, um, made him stand trial. That doesn't happen all the time. So, and I agree. Sometimes my dad would always say that whenever we lived in kind of a, a curious neighborhood is, you know, you just make friends with your neighbors. You're safest here. <laughs> as long as, as long as you're friends with the, with the criminals, you're good. Maybe, maybe that's not what you were trying to say, but that was my life. So, all right, moving on. Um, let me see if my request has been approved. Ooh. Let me see. 